Good evening or good afternoon or whatever time that uh, you are watching this. Uh, you are watching the fifth midweek Lenten service here from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Fremont. And our service begins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. Out of my distress I call upon the Lord. And the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side, and I will not fear. What can man do to me? I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. The right hand of the Lord is exalted, and the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die but live and recount the deeds of the Lord. With the Lord we shall do valiantly, and it is he who will tread down our foes. Let us join in confessing our sins to God our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we confess that we are bound to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. We have not produced spiritual fruit in keeping with the new life that you have won for us. For the sake of Jesus' sacrifice, Grant us your forgiveness. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts, and let your face shine that we may be saved. Amen. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness before the children of Israel, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in that the world might be saved through him. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our service continues with the fifth portion of our Lord's Passion history, as it is recorded according to the four Gospels, as we hear part five entitled Calvary. The soldiers now had charge of Jesus, and carrying his own cross, Jesus went out of the city to a place called Skull Hill, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. As they led him away, they, they laid hold of Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, who was coming in from the country. On him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Following him was a great company of people and of women who bewailed and lamented him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. The days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never gave suck. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things with a green tree, what will happen with a dry one? There were also two others, criminals, whom they led along to be put to death with him. When they came to the place called Golgotha, they gave him wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. It was the third hour, and there they crucified him. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The two criminals they also crucified with him, one on his right, the other on his left, with Jesus in the middle. The scriptures were then fulfilled, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they cast lots to divide his clothes and decide what each should take. They made four parts, one for each soldier. There remained his tunic, which was without seam, woven in one piece from top to the bottom. They said to one another, let's not tear it, but let's cast lots to see who will have it. The scriptures were then fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. These things the soldiers did and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head was put the charge against him, 
Pilate wrote the notice to be placed on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This title was read by many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. The chief priests of the Jews then said to Pilate, You should not write the King of the Jews, but that this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. People stood by watching, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross that we may see and believe. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. The thieves who were crucified with him also reviled him, and one of the criminals who hung with him railed at him. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are getting what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today, with, today you will be with me in paradise. Now near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clothus, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. Here ends this portion of our Lord's Passion History. Thanks be to God. For our devotion for our midweek lesson, our midweek service today, as we continue in the, in the general Lent theme of the Son of God goes forth to war, we want to hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 6, verses 60 through 69. When many of the disciples heard this, they said, That's a hard saying. Who can listen to that? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to him, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So far the text. Dear Christian friends this evening who are joining us in worship, it was first recorded back in 440 B.C., by a man named Herodotus. And it happened to an infantryman, a soldier, who was fighting in a war against the Persians called the Battle of Marathon. The man's name was Epizelus. And Epizelus and his best friend had signed up to fight this battle uh, with the Athenians against the Persians. And as they were in the heat of the battle, Epizelus saw something that absolutely terrified him. 
he saw his best friend brutally killed by a Persian. As he looked back up, he couldn't see anything anymore. He was struck blind. And as Herodotus noted, his wound was not one that was physical, but rather one that was psychological. Falling to the ground, Epizelus managed to survive the battle, but as Herodotus tells us in his history, Epizelus was blind for the rest of his life. Today we know that there's a reason for that. We call it PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. In World War I, people called it shell shock. In World War II, people called it battle fatigue. And probably the most famous incident where battle fatigue was seen and recognized as a condition was an incident that happened to Lieutenant General George S. Patton. As he was beginning the, the Sicilian invasion for the Allies, he was touring the hospital, and he saw two soldiers in that hospital who weren't suffering from any kind of injury. And looking at them, he started to yell at them. He started to berate them. He started to belittle them. And he, he made the men actually break down in tears. The incident became one of national interest as people were outraged by what had happened. You can see that entire episode in a movie called Patton. And as we're all in this period of confinement, that's a movie worth watching. Now George Patton, if you remember him, was remembered for his inspiring speeches, for his commanding personality, as well as his, his wonderful strategies that brought World War II to a fast victory. But Patton's speeches, personality, and strategies couldn't prepare his men for the horror, for the trauma, and for the reality of what war is. This, today, as we hear these words of Jesus, Jesus is preparing himself for the battle. And Jesus goes forth as the Son of God to win our salvation. And Jesus is speaking about the reality of what this war is going to be all about. He is going to have to sacrifice himself his body and blood would be given in sacrifice for the sake of the victory. But that same body and blood would be given to his disciples to eat and to drink. That didn't make sense. That was simply unbelievable. And that's why we see there was desertion. There was desertion in the ranks. Some couldn't come to grips with what Jesus was actually saying. And Jesus still comes to us and says, will you go away? Tonight as we hear these words of Jesus, and as we think about the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf, consider this thought, no other words greater than Jesus. Because first of all, his words are the words that brought sorrow and epic disappointment for many, but his words, my friends, are the words that bring us life and blessing. Now for a moment I want you to imagine having to feed, having to feed all of the people gathered in the Pfizer Forum for one game of the Milwaukee Bucks. Could you imagine what that would be like? What kind of preparations would you have to have? Think of all the people you would have to have preparing the food. Think of all the people you would have to have waiting on the people. Think of the cost, think of the expense. It would seem to be impossible. In the events preceding our text, Jesus was faced with a similar situation. 5,000 people had come to hear him preach and to teach, and it was now getting towards the evening. Jesus wanted to take care of them, but all Jesus had were five loaves and two small fish. But Jesus because he is the God-man, because he is the Son of God from all eternity, because he comes to do the Father's will, takes care of the people. And by means of a miracle, he feeds all of those people, 5,000 plus, including women and children. Now you can imagine that would make Jesus an instant celebrity, wouldn't it? And as far as the people were concerned, this was their brand new leader. He was going to lead them to the promised land. 
the promised land of what they truly wanted. But then comes that statement. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And you know what? That produced an instant reaction. That's a hard saying, the people said. Who can, who can listen to it? In one way, they just simply couldn't stomach it, to part, if you pardon the pun. But two things really got to them. The first thought is the claim that Jesus makes in our text of being the Son of God from heaven. They thought they knew everything there was to know about Jesus. Jesus, the carpenter's son from Nazareth. Jesus, Mary's boy. They thought they understood all that Jesus was all about. But Jesus, Jesus giving his very body and blood as a sacrifice, Jesus then telling his followers, you have to eat my body and blood, that was too much. How could Jesus bring life that way? But Jesus keeps right on teaching. Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all, Jesus says. These words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless this granted to him by the Father. The second thing that they really find a problem with Jesus is the fact that Jesus, in a sense, is preparing them for a battle as well. His very uh, suffering and dying on, on Calvary would also enlist them in this battle as well. But that was unbelievable. Why would a general lead his people into battle and then the general himself die and then say that as a result of his death, there would be life. That didn't make sense either. But you know, my friends, it isn't only the disciples of Jesus' day that have a problem sometimes with Jesus. What about you and I? In so many ways, we too are like Jesus' disciples of yesterday. We want a chill Savior. A Savior who kind of chills out. A Savior who's putting everything on the back burner, so to speak. He isn't going to ask much of you or me. He's going to be someone that, well, we can talk to and listen to on that occasional stray Sunday that we have open where we can come to church and listen. Other than that, everything's on autopilot. Jesus has taken care of salvation. So in the end, he's just going to keep on giving as far as our heart's desire is concerned. And you know what? Maybe at this very moment, we're suffering from a little bit of PTSD. We can hardly believe what's happened in the last three weeks. And maybe like you, like me, you're, you're having it very hard to find some kind of normalcy when it comes to life. How, how do we handle this? How do we deal with this? And then comes the bigger question, the biggest question of all, where's God in all of this? Why would God let this happen? Doesn't God see? Doesn't God care? The trouble is, we kind of erase the reality of sin out of our lives. We are to see ourselves as really the model examples of what society ought to be as Christians. We're the example of Christians that, when it comes to marriage, family, and church, maybe you see yourself as the best employee the boss has. But make no mistake, photoshopping and airbrushing ourselves Sin still remains. That's the reality. And more than that, it bundles us together, as God says, from the mildest to the worst of sinners. Yes, Jesus is preparing us for battle, my friends. But he has promised us. And his resurrection from the dead has sealed the victory for you and for me. The mop-up operation is underway right now as we live our lives. Satan isn't suing for peace. He's still trying to get as many as he can. God is preparing us for the day-to-day -day battle that we're engaged in. The moment that all of us are experiencing together. But we don't lose hope. 
We don't give up. We don't throw in the towel. We remember the words of Peter. Peter says, humble yourselves, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he can lift you, lift you up and cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Yes, we are all experiencing anxious moments because we don't know what a new day will bring. And that's why, secondly, we also need to see that the need to listen, to hear, and believe and rejoice in Jesus' words and promises. They are filled with life and blessing. Yes, many people were offended by what Jesus had to say. Many people walked away in epic disappointment because Jesus didn't turn out to be the kind of Savior God or King or General that they wanted. So Jesus turns today and he says to you and to me, do you want to, do you want to go away? Jesus' answer for us is one that expects a resounding no. And by the grace of God, I hope you're saying no, in spite of the difficulties. Why? Because Jesus is giving us a moment. He's giving us a precious moment, a moment that he gave to Peter. And think about that for a moment. As Jesus turned to the, his disciples, the 12, and said, are you going to go away? God, Jesus is giving them the opportunity now to speak up. In other words, that faith that is buried in their hearts needs to have a voice. It needs to speak. It needs to act. And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. When you stop to think about that, those were words that only the Holy Spirit could inspire. Words that only the Holy Spirit could give to Peter. Because this is this God-given faith in action. Peter expressing that wonderful gift of trust and belief that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Jesus is calling us today to call upon Him as that Holy One of God. He's calling us to remember that He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's calling us to remember that He's that great High Priest that makes the sacrifice of Himself to wash all of our sins away once and for all. And He is that glorious King who is going to come to take us home to his eternal place of glory that he is preparing for us. But at this moment, God is giving you the tremendous opportunity to let your faith be seen. To let your faith be seen in picking up the phone and reaching out to friends and neighbors. To express your faith in praying. To express your faith in knowing and believing that God in the right time and in the right moment will lift this heavy burden upon that we are all experiencing. Yes, these words of Jesus are filled with such comfort. Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And as he gives us that question today, do you also want to go away? We can stand up and say, no, Lord, you are the Holy One of Israel. Who are we going to go to? You are our help. You are our refuge. You are our great defender. You are our glorious king who has come to bring us life out of death. So as we see the Son of God going forth to war, may we rejoice in this God who is with us every step of the way. And yes, the moments are difficult. Yes, maybe we're feeling stress and anxiety of what the new day will bring. But have no fear. Jesus is there. He is there to bring you the comfort of his victory and to assure you that he is with you every step of the way. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, we adore your love and your praise and your great, and your great compassion. We thank you for the agony that you experienced by wearing that crown of thorns and, and the painful cross that you endured for all of us. We know that in no way, shape, or form we are deserving of this mercy because each day we sin and each day 
we find ourselves questioning, wondering whether you are really in control. Well, Jesus, you are the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And do not forsake us in this moment of trial and distress, but have mercy upon us evermore. Grant us your peace. That peace that we cannot give to ourselves, but that peace that comes from your words and promises. As you have loved us, even so may we draw our attention away from the things of this world and this life to you alone. To you alone who brings peace and love and mercy. As we have made, as you have come to be our sin offering, may we find comfort, joy, and hope that you will strengthen us in your grace for every conflict and every moment that we feel afraid. As you have left us an example, an example where you follow the Father's will and listen to his words and promises, so may we walk in your footsteps and grant them that looking to you, the author and finisher of our faith, we may run with patience the race that is set before us and hereafter obtain the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. All this we ask in your name as we join together to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our service concludes with a uh, selection from the hymn. 